right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Brian Clayton, who is in Nashville, Tennessee. How are you doing, Brian? Hey, I'm great, John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And Brian is the CEO and co-founder of Green Pal, which is an online marketplace that connects home growers Home, own, home growers, homeowners with local lawn care professionals. Home growers would be quite an interesting thing as well, but we'll stick with, we'll stick with homeowners for now. And what we're going to talk about is growing your business to eight figures in revenue. And, and Green Pal that, uh, that uh, Brian co-founded has been called the, the kind of Uber for lawn care by Entrepreneur Magazine. Okay, so, so uh, Brian, as we know, like, revenue we tend to have these psychological revenue thresholds it's like you know getting to getting to six figures and then getting to seven figures and then you eight figures in revenue what is the difference between getting to say seven figures in revenue and getting to eight uh, figures in revenue what, what processes and, and changes do you have to go through to achieve that level of growth yeah i think everything that's big starts small. So, you know, for instance, when we started GreenPow, we, we've been at this for seven years and we're going to do $20 million in revenue this year. But our first year we ended with $10,000 in total revenue. And so, and so it was kind of a humble start, but we knew that if we, so long as we kept keep doubling revenue every year that we end up growing a, a, a decent sized business. So I think when you're starting a new business from scratch, it's important to, to, to fire bullets than cannonballs. So experiment with what's working, try to figure out uh, what, what uh, your value proposition is, what's causing your customers to say yes, and really go through that, that period of learning uh, what works and learning what doesn't work and then lean into what works. I think a lot of times <clears throat> as business owners, we try to be good at everything. And we try to, we try to, uh, uh, fix what's not working. And what I think when it comes to sales and creating a sales engine in your business, it can help to just do more of what's already working. And so I think a lot of uh, businesses, uh, successful businesses, uh, really are good at one or maybe two channels. And I think what, what causes a lot of entrepreneurs to get hung up is that they try to be good at every channel. They try to be good at Instagram ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, organic search, uh, TikTok uh, mm -hmm. sponsorships, whatever. And the reality is, as a business owner, you, you really need to double down on one channel and just really do more of what's already working. And that can help get you to seven figures and then beyond. Yeah, no, it's a great points that you outlined there, Brian, because I do think obviously when when anybody starts a business, uh, any revenue looks like good revenue. So you chase after so many different things. And as you said, um, taking a step back and figuring out what your ideal uh, what your ideal customer looks like or customers look like and, and focusing in on them, because, yeah, the temptation is to just chase after revenue all over the place. And then the other point that you raised there, which I think is an excellent one as well, is uh, it's a double-edged sword. We have so many different channels today, which is great, means that you can start a, a business like from your own home or whatever, but we also have a lot of channels too. Right. So understanding which are the ones to go after is, is a challenge in itself. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's okay to go wide in the early days, like, like looking at your business almost as a video game, like 10 mm -hmm. levels of this video game, like the first two levels of Super Mario World, you know, it's okay to experiment in all of these different channels, figure out what's working. But once you get into level three, four, five, six, and, and you get past a half million in revenue, million in revenue, now you're chasing down 5 million in revenue, you really got to double down on what's working and just be the best in the world or the best in your market at one service, one thing, one offering, and in one channel is, is what's going to get you to eight figures it's really hard to get to eight figures by diluting your focus and going wide and trying to be all things to all people in all channels that's more of that's more of a boutique industry and that's you're going to be more of a in a self self-employed dynamic you right. won't create a business trying to uh trying to be all things to all people in all channels yeah no it, it, it's a really good point and we just give a shout out to luigi because he never gets mentioned when Super Mario comes <laughs> <up with him. laughs> um but, it, but it, to your point, right, is as you grow, obviously, you have to start looking at other people and other skill sets and so that you're not, as you said, otherwise you continue to be like the solopreneur trying to do everything yourself. Um, how difficult it is, like in your, in your experience, like building your business, how difficult is it 
to start to let go of some things in order to grow? Yeah, you know, one of my favorite books is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And one of the things he talks about in that book is when you're first getting started, even if it's just you or you and a helper or five or 10 people, you really need to create an org chart for all of the roles in your business. And so that's every single thing that has to be done in your business. So that's that's head of operations, head of customer satisfaction, head of marketing, HR, uh, you know, the person that sweeps the floor at night, the person that orders the materials, the per- you know, all of these things. In the early days, you're doing all of it. And it's your name on every one of those roles in the org chart. But as time goes on, you can peel your name off of some of these roles. And so even like drilling down like on the head of marketing, it's not just head of marketing. It's, okay, who's writing content for the blog? Who is managing the Facebook ads campaign? Who is running experiments in Google AdWords trying to figure out what works there? Who is who is really honing in on the value proposition to figure out what copy makes it, uh, our, uh, our customers say yes? It's your name on all of those tasks. But as time goes on, you might be able to delegate some of those roles to a a subcontractor or a freelancer or an employee. And so just kind of easing your way into uh, peeling your name off the, 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 the roster of all of these roles is how you can kind of slowly build a team around you. Yeah, and, and I think the other part too today is that, I mean, we're, we've, as I said, we're kind of spoiled today, but you don't have to look at it, like you said, you don't have to look at it as, okay, I have my org chart, I need to hire somebody for this. You don't necessarily need to hire an employee for that. You can go to Upwork, maybe you find a contractor, you find a fractional person. I mean, there's so many ways of filling that out now. But the important part, I think, uh, Brian, is probably to look at yourself and really ask yourself honestly, what are you really good at? And what are the things that maybe you're adequate at, but the things that you want to have somebody who's good at doing? Oh, that's, that's exactly right. You, and, and, you know, in the early days, you're kind of, you're kind of doing the stuff you're not good at for a little Mm -hmm. while until you figure out, okay, this is how I'm going to delegate it. But you made a very good point. It's so much easier to to get a a fractional person in some of these roles today that whereas five or 10 years ago, you either had to hire them full time or not at all. And that was a really tough dynamic to be in. But now let's say you need a CFO. You can hire a fractional CFO to look over your, your books and keep everything on track financially for a few hundred dollars an hour. And they're really good. And that might be all you need at this stage of the game. The other point I'd like to make there too is, is no matter uh, whoever you're trying to hire as a freelancer or as employee, it's better to, to hire an expert and somebody who's really, really, really good for an hour or two a week for a, for a high price, whether it be $100, $200, $300 an hour. It's much better to hire somebody who's an expert at, at a few hours than to hire somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're doing for 40 hours a week. Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent point. And it really does. I mean, the the opportunities today are fantastic, because like you said, you can you could hire a top quality CFO for a couple of hours a week uh, with the skill set that you couldn't possibly hope to pay for a full time in your company. But you get the quality and somebody of that high quality and high level only needs a couple of hours a week, because let's face it, I mean, most businesses, when they're growing, they don't need a they don't need a full time CFO anyway, or other other kind of jobs like that. Exactly. And a lot of times, too, is is they can uh, set in place uh, a cascading series of events that cause you and your team to work around them and fulfill some of the things that they're laying out. So like a very high quality uh, uh, search engine optimization analyst can say, look, here's about 45 things you need to fix. And here and here and here's the list you need to tackle. And then you you and some of your some of your lower level people can tackle that list and not pay them two or three hundred dollars an hour to do it. You can do it. But guess what? It's the same. The end result is the same as getting them full time. They can be kind of a change agent, if you will, inside of your business that you can you can afford to hire them and bring in that level of expertise for a few hours a week until you can afford to pay somebody what they're worth, which is, you know, one hundred fifty, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year, which you can't afford that in the beginning, but you can afford a thousand a month. Yeah. So, I mean, so the opportunities to scale your business with variable resources today is better than it's ever been. So ever been. you should, yeah. So you should be very careful about looking about what, what fixed costs, what, what, uh, what full-time employees you take on and what things you leave fractional or variable, because it gives you so much more flexibility than ever before. 
Absolutely. And the sad reality is, is most business owners don't even think to do it that way. And then they get stuck and they don't get any of this expertise inside of the, of the business. And then they, they plateau, they plateau at a half million in revenue, a million in revenue, because they don't have the kind of high level systems uh, and DNA coming into the business. Whereas now you can, you can bring these folks in and afford to do it and ease your way into it. It's just easier than it's ever been. So if you were looking back now and advising yourself, uh, is there are there any things that that uh, maybe you look back and you did you say that I would do differently today if I knew that? Yeah, it's it's a lot along the lines of what we're talking about right now is is figuring out how to put yourself in a position to where you can delegate quicker and delegate to people who are just a lot better at it than you are. But I got in trouble when we started this business because uh, I, my, my first company was just, a, was just a landscaping company. And, and I had ran that for 15 years. I built a lawn mowing business, just me and a push mower to me and 150 people. I got that business over $10 million in revenue and I sold it. So here I am. I sold this landscaping company. I retired. I think I know everything about business. And I think to myself, OK, I want to start a new business. I'm going to start an app now. And uh, I want to start the Uber for lawn mowing. I recruited two co-founders and we didn't know the first thing about how to write software. Didn't know mm -hmm. how to design software. Didn't know how to, didn't know how to distribute software. Uh, and so luckily we didn't know what the hell we were doing because the naivete is what got us into the game. But uh, we delegated too quickly. We hired mm -hmm. a, uh, a development agency in Nashville where I live uh, and paid them like $150,000 to build the first version of GreenPal. And we thought, okay, we'll just market this and we'll be off and running. And man, we launched this thing and it was a total flop, total failure. It didn't have the features it needed. It didn't work. I, I mean, we didn't even know what the hell it needed to be. And so we had to go through this period, this morning period of understanding like, okay, if we're going to be in the tech business, we got to learn how to build tech. And so we had to like work on ourselves and work in the business at the same time. And over a three year period of time, my two co-founders and I learned how to build software. We built the second version ourselves. And then that the scar tissue hadn't healed quite yet. And we, we held on too long. We, we did mm -hmm. a lot of it ourselves for too long and we didn't delegate soon enough. And so it was kind of a, it, on the one hand, we delegated too soon, got us into trouble. It cost us like two years and 200 grand. But on the other hand, we didn't learn quick enough and we didn't delegate too quickly, uh, didn't dele delegate quick enough once we started to get some acumen and, and some core competencies in place. So that's what, mm -hmm. if I could do it differently, I would have delegated much sooner, but I was still mm -hmm. like, I was still tore up about about pissing that money away. <laughs> yeah, and and that and that's such a that's such a great uh, that's such a great uh, insight that you just provided there because yeah, uh, you know you would think yeah you know let's just go outsource and get it done and everything but but you have to have a, a little bit of experience at that right right uh, it's not that simple you know, and I think people sometimes make a lot of mistakes around that because like we said yes you have availability across the globe you have availability of people that at very good price rates, uh, um, you know, depending on where you want to go. But that doesn't mean that you have the experience of how to work with an outside company. Right. Uh, uh, outsourcing, uh, delegating, working with freelancers can accelerate what's already working really well. But there has to be a foundational like core that that's already working. And so we kind of had to build that ourselves with my two co-founders where we had something that was humming and working. And then we started delegating and it started like accelerating that progress. But you can't just outsource your way um, from the cold start. You yeah. have to you have to get over that cold start yourself. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, some things that we've even, uh, you know, outsourced ourselves in the, in the past, it has always been, as you said, it's always been things that we already either have set up, or we know how to do it, and we know what right. the expectations are, and then you hand it off. And yeah, and that's, it's a it's a learning curve. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and what are what are maybe some of the things that surprised you, maybe about the business as the business started to grow? Were there some things that you said, oh, well, I never even thought about that. I never realized that as the business grow, these are issues we'd have to deal with. You know, for us specifically, we're building a marketplace. We're building a marketplace mm -hmm. that connects buyers and sellers. I thought we were just building an app that helped people get the grass cut. But once we started getting in the game, we started realizing, like, holy crap, we're, we're, we're building a marketplace. We have to orchestrate the delicate balance between the wants and desires on both sides of this transaction. And that took a long time. It was something that we didn't know we were going to have to come up against. It just took a long time of trial and error of, 
of orchestrating the delicate balance between what homeowners want and what what lawn care service professionals need to make a living and it and and, and a lot of times we over we over waited on one side or the other and then, it, then the market began to unravel that was one thing i didn't realize it was going to, how hard it was going to be and so anybody that's that's wanting to start a marketplace, you know, for anything that's connecting buyers and sellers that they just need to understand that that's going to be a learning process. It's going to take years to figure out and you got to be willing to do it. Yeah, no, that's fascinating because I mean, it sounds like you almost have, it, it is like a balancing act, you know, you have to like figure out the, how both sides of the equation can feel like it, it's a win-win. But it's an interesting point though, that you brought up is that the business that you ended up in is not the business that you thought you were going into, right? You thought you were creating, you know, an app and yes, you did, but you were creating actually in the end a, a marketplace. Um, how quickly did you realize that was the case? really early when it wasn't working you know uh the market is a relentless purveyor of feedback to you and that's and that's one of the beautiful things about starting a business any kind of business is it can cause you to be a more humble person because you're always going to be getting feedback from the market and so one thing we did do uh correct um we read a book called the startup owner's manual by the by author named steve blank and then another book called The Lean Startup by uh, Eric Reese. And these books kind of tell you the same thing. They, they tell you to make it as easy as possible for customers to speak to you. And so we removed all friction for anybody who tried out our app to, to talk to us. Talk to me, talk to my co-founder seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And that feedback enabled us to understand okay, this is really what we need to be building. This is what people expect for the, for the product to do and on both sides of the transaction. And, and so over time, because we had that relentless feedback just flowing to us, we began to understand, okay, this is how we need to change things. This is how we need to improve things. Rather than just like taking these gambles and not knowing it was going to work, we then began to understand, okay, this is, this is where we need to go. And I think it, it should go without saying, but a lot of business owners kind of, shy away from customer feedback or whether they know it or not make it hard for the customers to tell them how they're doing i think that's one thing that every business owner can do new small large make it insanely simple for customers to reach you as the owner so you can always never be at a loss to know what it is you need to be working on yeah no i think you've uh, i think you've just uh, hit on a couple of really important things i just want to underline I think um, absolutely on on the feedback and making yourself uh, contactable, because I think there's a lot of changes have happened over the last couple of years. I think uh, you know people all ran and hid behind technology for a while under the uh, you know using the excuse of where well efficiency, but re reality it was disconnecting you know consumers and and the and the vendors in many ways. I think with the pandemic and everything else, I think people crave more and more of that human contact. So I think to your point, if you're making yourself available, if you're a small business making yourself available, that's really, really critical. And I think the other the other point is taking the feedback, because let's face it, if, if you're um, somebody giving you feedback on your app or, or your, you know, early on, it's kind of your baby. So you're kind of calling, you know, Absolutely. if I'm giving you negative feedback, I'm kind of calling your baby ugly. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the thing too, is what somebody's going to tell you face to face, sitting with down with them at a coffee shop, you know, in the early days we did that, you know, we met with every single homeowner mm -hmm. that, that would meet with us in every coffee shop in town and they would give us feedback. But then once we started getting like, kind of like that, that just in at, in-app chat feedback where you're not face-to-face -face, the feedback got a lot more real and uh that's really the feedback you want and and so because and you're right you you can't take it personally it doesn't matter how many hours how many sleepless nights you have on this project it doesn't matter nobody cares they only want their problem solved and they're going to tell you if they're if you're not solving their problem and you have to take that and take it to heart and put that feedback to work and it's not happening to you as the entrepreneur it's happening for you mm. and if you can reframe it that way that it'll help you save years of wasted time building stuff that nobody wants no i love i love the way you put it there you know it's happening it's happening for you and you know, absolutely and um, no and it's such an it's such an incredible thing but you know, let's face it. I mean, you you obviously went through this as well, but quite often, and particularly with technology, is you can build it, you can build all the use cases, you can test, you can do all of these things, and your customer will find a way to use your technology in a way that you never could conceive of. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you just never know. It's, it's that Mike Tyson uh, quote, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the nose. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a business plan or an idea of what their product is until it hits customer use, uh, you know, and, and, it, and then you start to see all of the ways that they screw it up or they're really not screwing it up. You screwed up mm -hmm. because you made it, uh, you know, you, you made it breakable. And it, just from a standpoint of using it incorrectly or not even understanding what the hell it should do. And, and then you come to realize like, just how simple you have to make things. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to make it to where like an eight year old can use your product or, or somebody who's on a three day drinking binge can use your product. <laughs> like you literally do because the consumer, we're all guilty of it. Uh, the modern day consumer is, is egotistical, is selfish, just wants their needs met, has low bandwidth, doesn't want to read anything yeah. and you have to build the product. And I'm not, I'm guilty of this. Like, you have to build a product to, 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 to operate in that environment or else you're not going to get the traction. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it, it's so true. And you may want to filter out some of the feedback from the person on the three day drinking binge. <laughs> <laughs> but, but your point is, but your point is a really good one because, you know, whether we like it or not, um, you know, we live in this culture now where everybody expects everything to be easy, no intention span. If they hit a problem with the product, uh, they're just going to move on uh, right. because things have got commoditized. So, yeah, so you have to make it simple. And then to your point, you have to be ready to, um, you have got to be ready to help them and communicate with them so you can differentiate yourself by the overall, the totality of the experience they have with you. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that hand to hand, like combat customer feedback is great for sales. You're hand cranking the sales, but even better, you're getting the learnings to understand, okay, I've got one engineer or I've got five engineers or I got 20 engineers. These are the things they need to be working on because I'm always talking to users and I'm never at a loss to understand where we're taking the product, what the strategy is or what we need to be working on today because that customer feedback is driving all of those things. Whereas if you don't have that and there's a firewall between you and your users, then all of these people are working on something that nobody cares about and that, that's going to put you into a death spiral. Yeah, no, no, 100%. And I do think some companies that pay a lot of lip service, you'll see, I mean, if you pull up any corporate website today, you'll probably see customer centric or customer focused or something on that. But your experience with that brand is can often be very, very different. So absolutely. it's one thing, it's one thing putting the bumper sticker on, it's another thing living it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, one, you know, as we've grown, we're, we're, you know, we've got 30 people on the team, we have customer support people, but I still do a few hours a day of support tickets, in-app chat, phone calls, just to always keep me just right there in the trenches for, with what these, what our users are experiencing. So I don't have, I don't ever like have that firewall between what I, you know, company logic and customer logic, you, you always want to close that gap. And, and the, only, the reason I do this is because I'm a little paranoid, to be honest, like, I'm paranoid that if, if I, if, if I allow a gap to develop there, then I'll lead us down the wrong path. And then, and then that'll be game over. So that paranoia is what causes me to continue to, to interact with our clientele on a daily basis for a few hours a day. And that's really high leverage time for me. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's a great point. I can't remember who it was. It was the, the head of IBM or somebody when they dominated the market. He's just still said that, uh, you know, he was still paranoid every day about somebody <laughs> out there that was a competitor, you know, Should ready be. to. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a great point. Hey, uh, listen, Brian, this has been fantastic. So many great insights here, especially for, for startups and, and entrepreneurs. I really would encourage you to go back through it and listen. There's a lot of great nuggets here that can save you a lot of, uh, a lot of bother and help you. All of Brian's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, Brian, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your business. Yeah, so anybody that's listening to this that doesn't have time to cut their grass, they can just download Green Pal in the App Store and you'll get hooked up with a great lawn mowing service in a few minutes. Uh, anybody that's listened to my story here and and wants to reach out to me, if I can help you with a specific problem, just hit me up on uh, on LinkedIn and I'm all the time interacting with other business owners on, on LinkedIn. I'd be glad to help you. Yeah, so absolutely. So look out your window if your grass is uh, getting overgrown and you really don't feel like doing it yourself. Uh, download the app, uh, Green Pal app. Uh, listen, thanks again, Brian. This has been fantastic. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.